I thank you all for coming. It's a great pleasure to give this talk here in EC. Um, I want to talk to you today about a little about Bitcoin uh, that I think is uh, something that really combines economics and computation and electronic commerce. Uh, so I hope you'll find it interesting. Um, this talk is based on a paper uh, and work with Google Hugelman and C.M. Ekman Emmy, both from Columbia Business School. Uh, the paper is uh, in Restart, uh, if you're interested to see more details. So the title of the paper is Monopoly Without Monopolist, and this stems from um, a kind of initial interest in Bitcoin. Um, we try to understand what is Bitcoin all about back in the day? And then we realized that Bitcoin is actually really interesting for, for an economics perspective because it helps eliminate the harms of monopoly. So what do we mean by that? Like you probably heard about Bitcoin uh, in the news, you heard the Bitcoin price going up, going down. Um, but it, in a sense, this is not really uh, that novel of a thing to have another tradable assets. The reason that we were really interested in Bitcoin was because the system on which Bitcoin is recorded has a really novel structure. It's a decentralized electronic ledger. It was um, a distributed system, it computer science innovation that enabled having a decentralized ledger, like a lot of uh, computers that all agree upon a common ledger and synchronize with each other without having any authorization on central, central authority. There's a bunch of anonymous computers that all agree and collectively maintain the ledger. So this was a really big uh, distributed system innovation at the time. And to an economist, this is really interesting because that generates a new market structure. Instead of having a firm that provides those services, those payment services, you have something that's much more like a two-sided market. Like users get services of like any other payment system. But the services are not provided by a firm, they're provided by anybody who wants to. You can just download software now and become a miner, become part of the network of computers that runs the back end of Bitcoin. All those computers are, um, are kind of collectively part of the protocol. The protocol uh, is a set of code that dictates rules for the system, and nobody owns the system, nobody um, is in charge of the code. Um, there's some sort of constitutional convention that like we all agree to some protocol that for the purpose of the talk, we'll think about it as immutable. And that gives us a very different market structure. So for, just to uh, clarify things before I start getting into the rest of the talk, for this purpose of this talk, we're going to abstract away from a bunch of issues that may be on your mind, like the Bitcoin to use the exchange rate, what makes Bitcoin valuable or not valuable, or whether Bitcoin is secure or not. All of those are really in interesting issues, but for the purpose of the talk, we're just going to assume that Bitcoin is working as a platform, and we're going to ask what kind of uh, market structure do we get from this new novel distributed system innovation. And to motivate this, let's start by asking what's wrong with the traditional payment system model. We know how to make payment system for a long time. You probably have multiple uh, payment system, electronic payment system in your wallet now. You probably have some Bank of America app, maybe PayPal or Venmo and so on. How do they work? Conceptually, it's very simple. You just have a large database and the firm makes sure that they maintain a database of records. Users have some access, authenticated access to update those records and you just do simple accounting uh, to maintain this. So conceptually, it's pretty simple. What's wrong with this? Okay. Well, one common uh, critic in the cryptocurrency world is that you need to trust the payment system provider. I need to trust Bay Bank of America that they're not messing up their accounts. Um, well, this certainly is a concern for some people. We don't think this is a major concern for most. Like, I think if you'll go to a person on the street and ask them the worried about Bank of America messing up their accounts, they'd be surprised uh, to even think about this. And for good reason, because, um, <coughs> sorry, because 
as a society, we were aware of all those trust issues and we developed institutions that make it so we can trust Bank of America or other record keepers. We have accountants, we have rule of law, we have, make sh- we have ways to make sure that the record keepers are kept honest. But as an economist, there's two major issues that you should be worried about. Um, and both of them stem from the fact that you're not going to have a perfect competitive market in payments for multiple reasons. One is because of trust. It, not everybody can be a payment provider. But even more than that, like um, there are network effects in payment processing. I want to have a Visa or MasterCard if merchants will accept my Visa or MasterCard. And it's going to be very hard to start a new credit card because I need to convince merchants that customers will adopt it, and I need to convince customers that merchants will accept it. Um, and as a result, there are four credit cards in the US. Uh, Visa and MasterCard and Amex are both very big companies with a lot of market powers. And there's a lot of litigation, a lot of antitrust litigation, a lot of regulation about how much should those payment processing companies should be allowed to charge. And those are very heated debates. Of course, uh, payment infrastructure is very important for the economy. And payments by themselves are a large sector of the economy. Um, The global revenue of payment processors was almost $2 trillion a couple of years ago. So this is is big money, um, big concerns. And there's reasons why we don't see perfect competition here. And by the way, I put Venmo and PayPal on the slide, but PayPal actually owns Venmo. So we have some concerns about uh, monopoly deadwood loss, about pricing, and we may want to do something about it to avoid the harms of monopoly here. So Bitcoin provides some sort of alternative. And to describe this alternative, it's, um, it's convenient to go in two steps. So first step, if we think of Venmo or PayPal as the train, we replace the train with many uh, individual cars, and Bitcoin is more like the Uber. Instead of having some major server somewhere, we allow everybody to become part of the server network for uh, for Bitcoin. And just like everybody can drive for Bitcoin and provide transportation services, everybody can become part of the Bitcoin infrastructure. You can download some software and we take part of Bitcoin transaction processing. And as uh, in as in the traditional systems, the servers who provide the service will get compensated. Users will get charged some amount of money, or somehow the network will create some value and have to create it to the miners. Miners will still need to be compensated for the services. Um, but as opposed to Bitcoin, uh, sorry, as opposed to as opposed to um, Uber, Bitcoin goes one step further. Because if you think of Uber or other platforms, there's still a company that owns the platform itself. Though In Bitcoin, nobody owns the platform itself. The platform is just a system of code. Yeah? There's code that determines how the protocol uh, is supposed to look like. Um, uh, this, this specifies what users do, what miners do, and how they interact. So it's not like uh, Uber, because Uber has capability to control its network and dictate uh, how much uh, how much drivers will get charged, or will, will uh, how much drivers will pay, or how much will they they will get to charge. Um, in Bitcoin, nobody gets to dictate any any of those decisions. Um, it's much more like we have a market on Tuesday afternoon and we all meet on Tuesday afternoon because everybody else comes on Tuesday afternoon. Uh, think of the Wi-Fi protocol. Uh, it's another uh, good analogy. So this creates a really two-sided network, uh, two-sided marketplace, which rules that are dictated by the protocol. And from those rules, we want to understand, do we get something more advantageous to the users and the miners? Under the firm, we know that the firm will get to set the rules. Uh, the firm will get to dictate how much e- users will pay, how much infrastructure we deploy. 
how much, how will all those decisions happen under Bitcoin? How much will miners get paid? How much will the users have to pay? So this is going to be the focus of the talk, really, this table. So in order to do so, we need to take the distributed protocol and translate it into economic model. And here are like some highlights uh, of the main features of the Bitcoin protocol that we translate into our economic model. Some of those are things that are very fundamental to the distributed system uh, design and uh, things that are hard to change. Some of those are more of a design choice. Uh, but I'm just going to describe all of those as they happen in Bitcoin. And um, there's a lot of variations uh, in future protocols and future coins. And of course, like all of the all of, uh, all of the space is going through tremendous evolution. And uh, if you think that something will be better differently, uh, that's going to be a really great start for research question. Yeah. So under Bitcoin, when a user sends a transaction, they get to specify how much they will pay in transaction fee. They get to dictate the transaction fee. Those transactions get sent to something called the mempool, and they become pending and visible to the miners. Periodically, every 10 minutes on average, a miner gets selected to process some transaction, which is called mining the block. Mining a block which just says you get a, to add a block of data, a batch of transaction data to the ledger, and all the transactions that are added within this block are considered processed. The miners get rewarded when they get selected to add a block, to mine a block, and they get to collect the block's transaction fees as well as new coins that are made for the miner. New blocks are added on average every 10 minutes, but because of the way that the system actually randomly selects a miner, there's randomness in how, uh, how long it takes before a block is found, uh, and it's going to be really well approximated by a Poisson process. Uh, and the randomness is going to be important. Sometimes it's going to be five minutes, sometimes it's going to be 15 minutes until somebody finds a block. And that means that there's going to be potential for delays. The system for capacity overall, in terms of how many transactions per unit time can the system process, is independent of the number of miners. So this sounds a bit weird initially when you hear it. Like that means that if I double the amount of computational power in the system, it means I still can process the same amount of uh, transactions per unit time. And to get some intuition to this, like it's helpful to think that the really difficult thing in Bitcoin in this distributed systems is to create synchrony between all the different computers in the network to make sure that everybody agrees with everybody else and which transactions went through and the balances of everybody. If you add more computers, in some sense, you make the problem harder, not easier. So one block is going to be selected uh, on average once every 10 minutes. The block has a limited size, again, due to distributed system constraints. Um, so that means that if I can process a block of one megabyte every 10 minutes, and that's roughly corresponds to the transactions, I can do 2,000 transactions every 10 minutes on average. And that doesn't uh, depend on how many miners I have. And last. What Bitcoin enables is that miners are free to enter and exit. They're completely anonymous. They can start mining, working on the network. They can shut down whenever they want. They're free to enter and exit. Okay. So we take those features and translate them into an economic model. Uh, so for the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all of our mutation. I'm just going to say one assumption that we have that um, there's the regime that we focus in the analysis is where the system has enough capacity to process all the transactions, at least on average. Okay? So if you take a day, the amount of transactions that come per day uh, is, uh, can fit within the processing capacity of the system. Um, this, this is, uh, for several reasons, the more interesting regime to focus on. In the paper, we talk about the other one as well, like the, when the system is over capacity as well. Okay. Yeah. So what is going to be the equivalent of Bitcoin? We start by talking about one of the two sides. We need to think about the miners and the users. We start by thinking about the miners because they're in a really simple under this, uh, under this system. 
Um, we assume that there are some miners that are small and active. That, roughly speaking, is that if you buy some mining rig, some equipment uh, to take part of the Bitcoin uh, network uh, just from the shelf, from Amazon, and you start mining, you break even, roughly break even. Um, there may be somebody in Iceland that has a cost advantage and they may have a much uh, more efficient mining equipment than you. They, they can do this more profitably. That's fine. As, but as long as there are some people on the margin that can just buy things off the shelf from Amazon. Then it means that no miner can properly affect transaction fees, even if you have a large miner. So what does this mean? It means that we get this title of a paper, monopoly without monopolists, that's where it comes from. Even if you have a large miner in the system, they will not uh, affect the prices that users pay. Why is that? If you're a small miner, you get selected once in a long time, and clearly like nobody should pay any attention to you in sending the transaction fees, you should have no effect on uh, the transaction fees that users select. But why wouldn't a large miner be able to affect transaction fees? Well, that is because of the free entry. So if you're a large miner, set with service, if no entry would happen, uh, you could potentially profit by saying, I'm not going to process any transactions that pay less than $10. That may induce some people to pay more in transaction fees because, like, let's say you selected 30% of the time. They don't want to take the chance, 30% chance that the transaction will get delayed. Um, so they will uh, increase the transaction fees, uh, and that will be good for you um, as, a, as a large miner that will see larger transaction fees. But as long as some of the small miners are active, the increased transaction fees will also benefit the small miners. And the small miners will also want to enter now because there's more transaction fees for them. And what we show in the paper is that those small miners will free ride this increase in transaction fees and basically erode all the benefit that the large miner can get by trying to affect uh, uh, the payments, uh, the transactions paid by users. So, Free entry is really essential to this result. The large miners do have the potential to affect the transaction fees, but when there's free entry, uh, they will not want to do that because every benefit they can they can generate will get completely eroded by the entry of small miners. That build them. Yeah. So this gives users a very strong uh, protection from monopoly pricing. It means even if the small number of large miners on the network, they don't get to determine pricing. You know, and pricing is determined by something else. Okay. Um, the other thing I, wanted to, I, I need to tell you is how many miners will we have? And for that, we look at how much payment is going to miners. The previous result says that all miners do the same thing, so they will share the total revenue that comes into the miners. Um, they will get some revenue from transaction fees and some revenue from the newly minted coin. Uh, if you note here, I have an exchange rate. Uh, that's the only place in the in, in the uh, paper that where we need an exchange rate because, like, when you decide on a transaction fee, you, you write the transaction fee in dollars, but you care how much. Uh, sorry, you write the transaction fee in Bitcoin, but you care how much is the transaction fee in dollar terms. Um, so the revenue can be counted in dollar terms. Likewise, the revenue of miners will go to pay the Christie, and therefore we care about how much is the dollar revenue. But the value of minted coins has to be specified by the protocol in advance. So right now, a miner in Bitcoin gets six and a quarter Bitcoin for every block. That was the size as well over eight years ago, and they had no idea at the time whether it's gonna whether those six and a quarter Bitcoins are gonna be worth. Forty thousand dollars each, thirty thousand dollars each, a thousand or a hundred or million. Yeah? So here we want to uh, clarify this and highlight the, the exchange rate here matters. Collectively, the miners will collect all this revenue, 
And if we have n mining units, each one of them will get one over n shell. We have a, a, a free entry of the small miners. The small miners will therefore break even. And from the break even conditions, we get the equilibrium number of miners. And if you look at this expression, you can see that the system, Bitcoin, basically takes all the revenue at its disposal and uses all of it to procure mining services, uh, which it buys at the price of the marginal miner. Uh, and by assumption, the marginal miners are the small miners that we assume they, they buy equipment off the shelf and they get this cost here. Um, I should say we ignore fixed cost here. Uh, there's a natural extension to talk about fixed cost as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so far, I told you that miners have no effect on the transaction fees of uh, paid by users. So the question is, what does determine the transaction fees that users will actually choose to pay? And for that, we model the choice of users as choosing first whether to participate or not. If the participant, they get some reward for processing the trans transaction. Uh, for example, if I send some money to somebody in, uh, in Venezuela and there's no other way of sending money other than using Bitcoin, then maybe I get a high reward if I want to pay for some furniture online and I can use my credit card instead of Bitcoin, maybe my reward is lower. Um, transactions may get delayed. And I may have more or less cost for delay, um, depending maybe if I'm buying something in person or maybe I'm buying something online, I may be more or less impatient. And last, users will also pay the transaction fees they, they choose to pay. And what we saw from the analysis of miners is that all miners will basically process blocks composed of transactions that offer the highest fees up to uh, filling the block. So we can think of the transaction fees as buying priority, and this will induce a congestion queuing game where all the users uh, that want to send a transaction decide whether they want to participate or not, send a transaction or not. And then if you participate, you think about what is the distribution of transaction fees that other uh, they'll send, how much transaction fee I want to send relative to them, and then how much delay am I going to suffer because of that. Importantly, this is all this game is going to be completely independent of the number of miners, because we said the number of miners do not affect the capacity. All the miners will choose to do exactly the same thing. So from the... Um, so from the... Um, uh, perspective of the users, we just think of a congestion queuing game. Yeah. Um, now we solve this congestion queuing game and we get a few nice properties. So if the willingness to pay uh, is sufficiently high, all users participate and they all receive and they all receive strictly positive surplus. And in fact, if the willingness to pay is sufficiently high, it doesn't matter. Because yeah? Once the willingness to pay is sufficiently high, what you'll get is that priority is going to be allocated efficiently. The more impatient agents are going to be given higher priority. And they're going to pay exactly the externality, which is going to be only the delay externality. Everybody is going to be processed. And how much will I need to pay for my higher priority? Exactly how much delay I impose on the people I cut in line in front of. This is independent of the, my willingness to pay, the willingness to pay doesn't actually enter to how much users pay. And it only depends on the congestion and how much delay I impose on other users. So we get uh, this very nice feature here of this network that not only um, the miners cannot affect transaction fees, we get that all users can get strictly passive surplus, which is impossible under a firm. And all users will get processed. The only question is how much delay uh, will users have? So to understand how much will users pay and how much will get the delay, let me give you uh, some data. And so first, this is uh, the figure that we get from our theoretical model. And I'm going to add real data on this, slide, on this slide in a second. 
Before I do, uh, before I show you that, let me just explain that on the horizontal axis, we look at the congestion, which we measure by block size. There's um, uh, up to 2017 in the period that from which we take the data here, that, that, which is simple, uh, simple. The blocks were one megabyte. If we look at the average size of block per day, we get on average how much of the system capacity was used during the day. On the vertical axis, we get how much users paid uh, in transaction fees per block. Uh, well, this is in US dollars because we think of what is the US dollar equivalent that we pay. And you can see three regions. If blocks on average are not full, then everybody will be processed in the next block. There's no reason to compete for priority. Nobody pays almost anything. The second region is when you get to hitting capacity. When you get close to hitting capacity, backlogs uh, are going to be very frequent. Whenever the system is at almost its capacity and some block is slightly delayed, a major back backlog will start. And uh, as a result, there's going to be a lot of delays and people will pay a lot. And there's also an intermediate regime. Even if the system has uh, only 80% of this capacity used, there's still excess capacity on average, those can still open up backlogs because sometimes the block will take 15 minutes to arrive. The backlog will arrive, it takes time for it to unravel, so some agents will get delayed. And because of that, there's already competition. There's going to start competition uh, for priority, and users will start paying already, despite the fact that still the system has excess capacity. So let me add dots here. Each dot here is one day of the Bitcoin data, taken from the blockchain data. Um, well, you see on the horizontal axis what percent of uh, blocks during the day was full, and on the horizontal axis how much transaction fees were paid. And you can see again that the same kind of three features appear in this data as well, and the real data as well, match what we had in our uh, what we had in our uh, theoretical prediction. And let me just zoom on um, on the more congested uh, regime. Uh, now we switch the vertical axis to log scale. And you can see that really uh, transaction fees start rising well before the system hits capacity because once you get to 70%, 80% utilization, already you start getting backlogs, delays, competition for payments, and the system starts raising revenue from uh, users who are unwilling to wait are very time sensitive. Yeah. Yeah. So with that uh, amount of time, let me just add one more thing saying that one of the functions of the market is to determine how much infrastructure we should have. This seems completely lacking from the design of the, of the, the market now. Um, payment to miners vary over time because, as you just saw, the revenue um, from transaction fees varies with congestion. The revenue from new coin varies with exchange rate. There's no reason to think that they vary in a way that's uh, that leads you to the desirable uh, to the desirable level of mining. Um, so when you hear that Bitcoin is using way too much mining. Well, it doesn't necessarily need that much mining. It's just that the bad marketplace makes it uh, makes it buy so much mining and waste a lot of electricity. Yeah. So certainly there's some major flaws in the design as well and room for future work. Um, and let me just leave you with a slide and kind of conclude and really kind of encourage the community to really think about market design issues and kind of like this is really kind of a, a, a really instance where you get to design a market. It has to be a decentralized system. There's a lot of computer science constraints. There's a lot of interesting economic constraints. Uh, really a lot of interesting questions uh, in this section here. And I think it's fascinating. And I hope that like uh, we'll see much more work about this and that like we'll see the next versions that uh, solve some of those questions. Uh, and get better, uh, better market designs. Okay? Um, thank you very much.